Welcome to A Word from the Lord. This is James Oldfield here with you. And this is a program brought to you by the Church of Christ that meets in Eden, 250 Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. We meet um, at Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, Thursday afternoons, Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. for Bible study again. And this is a program where you can call and ask your Bible question and let's discuss the Bible and let's try to find out why we're all different and where we differ, and what's keeping us apart. And so A Word from the Lord is a program that really is designed to help you in the community. And if you want to call in on this program, I'm going to go ahead and give you the phone numbers. The phone numbers are area code 336, and the first number is 427-9696. That's 427-WMYN. Or 627-9563, that's 627-WLOE, and those are the live calling numbers, and you can uh, call in at any time during this program, and we'll take your phone calls right here live on the air, and we'll have a Bible discussion. Friends, uh, if you would like to contact me, my name is James Oldfield, my uh, email address is a word from the Lord at gmail.com, and my phone number is 276 340 Two six five three, and uh, that you can reach me uh, just any time, really, twenty four hours a day. If I don't pick up right away, I'll get back with you. If you leave a message, you can send me a text. I I text, but two seven six three four zero two six five three is how you can reach me. But on the air, it's three three six four two seven nine six nine six four two seven nine six nine six or six two seven nine five six three. Six two seven nine five six three. Uh, what I want to talk about the, this afternoon is really an invitation that uh, everyone has, especially preachers. And the reason why this invitation is especially for preachers, for somebody might say, "Well, you know, you preachers, y'all, y'all invite everybody, y'all invite each other and pat each other on the back." No, the reason why this invitation is especially for preachers, is because preachers are supposed to be the ones that know the Bible. They're supposed to be the ones that are most uh, uh, versed, well-read in the Scriptures. Uh, James tells us in James chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that ye shall receive the greater condemnation. So there's a great responsibility placed upon preachers and their... Uh, they're preaching the they're preaching what they preach. Again, in First Timothy chapter four and verse sixteen, Paul said to Timothy, uh, he's already told him to do the work of evangelist, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Uh, actually, he t he tells him that in Second Timothy, but in First Timothy four, he tells him, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So the reason why we're making this special invitation to preachers, bishops, rabbis, elders, whatever they may call, they may call themselves, is because you're the ones that are having, the, you have the responsibility of, of, of teaching people, and you have the responsibility placed upon you uh, to make sure that what you're uh, teaching is sound doctrine, that what you're doing is what, God would have you do because it's going to save you and them that hear you. And so everybody who's listening has a responsibility to know if what they're being told is the truth. I mean, Peter's, Peter uh, uh, tells us to uh, uh, be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason to hope that's been in you. And John tells us to try the spirits to see whether they be of God or not. That's First John 3 and uh, verse 1. I think I missed that, but... Uh, uh, for one, but in any case, it is as a, a special invitation to the preachers because we want you to come and have a Bible discussion. Now, what we do is we're trying to do exactly what the Bible says. We're trying to get back to the Bible and do what the Bible says. And in the Bible, there was a an opportunity for all preachers to come together and have a Bible discussion. They actually had a big debate, a big discussion, and to see what. God had to say on a particular matter. Now, before we actually get into that, I want to uh, preface this by saying, or asking the question, is it wrong to discuss the Bible? Uh, I've had people tell me, 
quite often, really, when you start having the Bible discussion with them, usually some point, at some point in that discussion, it comes up and someone says, well, I don't want to argue the Scriptures. Now, up until that point, we have been arguing the Scriptures. Usually, uh, the statement about I don't argue the Scriptures comes in when they can't explain why they believe something. Then, all of a sudden, what we've been doing is arguing. But up until that time, we were just having a conversation. And most of the time, it's because the person uh, is doing all the talking, and then when you ask a question, a follow-up question about what they believe, all of a sudden it turns to arguing the Scripture. But friends, is there something wrong with discussing the Bible? Is there something wrong with, with, with discussing you know, what you think or what you believe or what you, uh, uh, conclusion you've come to on a particular verse and seeing if someone else has something differing on you? But yet, oftentimes what happens is when you have a differing, uh, let's just say a differing take, I don't want to say a differing opinion, but when you have, a, when you have a, a, an, an idea about what the uh, Bible is saying that's different from someone else, all of a sudden now you're arguing the Scriptures. And again, it's the preachers that usually have this uh, statement that's made, well, I don't, I don't argue the Scriptures. But yet, as long as they're getting to say their piece, it's fine. But yet, when someone asks another question, well, you know, I don't want to argue with you. I'm not, I don't argue the scripture. I don't debate the scripture. But friends, I want you to listen. I want you to listen to what some preachers have said, and actually, they, they're actually saying that uh, they should debate. Now, I'm going to play you uh, three. Uh, let's see. I'm going to play you three uh, uh, clips here. Three. Uh, sound bites, and I'm going to tell you who these are later on. Uh, but I want you to notice, listen to what's being said here, and then we'll make some comments on it. The, the first one is actually from a debate, and let's listen to what he has to say about this. Um, this is in a debate, and let me, let me make sure I got my volume up. We're here to debate a proposition tonight with with respect to salvation. Sorry about that. I need to get the mic. We're here to debate a proposition with respect to salvation. And uh, the goal of the project, uh, the goal of debating anything that Scripture says, is to make known the Word of God more plainly, more clearly. And at the same time, to cut off error. And uh, as the text that was put up shows us, we are to contend for the faith. We are to make distinctions about what the Bible says. We are to cut off error so that men can clearly understand more specifically, more clearly, what the Bible teaches. That no other denomination will, and, and I'm going to tell you, you folks have almost got me converted. Um, each time I watch you, I, 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 I glean something. But why is it that no other denomination will go up against you head to head? I, I don't understand it. What are they afraid of? Well, I think it's kind of what Charles was saying a moment ago, that we pinpoint the issues, and when persons... ...get into that kind of a debate at a, at a time if you want to go through... Bible. I love the debates you can't be times, Brad. I love it. I paid a lot of money to do it, too. Well, so, why are you going to have say your money? money. Did I hear him on the record say he was going to pay some of the money? I didn't hear it. I thought I heard that. Now, that was a good statement that Charles got on the tape. Last week, Johnny said, Johnny said, well, they won't debate, Brad. Let me tell you. All right, now, let me tell you who those, those individuals were. The first one you heard was a man named Mr. McDade. I can't remember his first name. He's a Presbyterian. And he was actually having a debate with uh, a young man. Uh, a gospel preacher, and he was actually saying, debate is good. We're here to debate the issues, to cut off error. Uh, it's good to have debate. Boy, I heartily amen that. Now, I differ with the Presbyterians. I, 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 would, uh, I would strongly disagree with Presbyterian doctrine, uh, but nonetheless, here was a man who was saying he was willing to debate him. And actually, in that debate, there were two Presbyterian preachers who were there to have a debate with one gospel preacher, and they were saying, yeah, it's good to have a debate. Well, I wish two Presbyterians or Baptists or Methodists or whatever would come, and let's have another, have another discussion. Now, the second man you heard was a man that was calling in on an interview that, uh, that, uh, I, that we were having with, um, it was uh, Charles was interviewing Johnny Robertson and myself, and 
the man said, why won't these preachers debate you? And so here's someone in the community that's actually saying, you know what, it's, it's good to have a debate. I wish they would. The third person you heard was, was a man named Larry Serber. Now, Larry Serber, some of you may know Larry Serber. Uh, he lived in Stoneville, uh, an atheist. He taught school in, in uh, Eden for a number of years. I'm, I'm not sure what grade. I think eighth grade. Uh, but he was he was an atheist, a teacher in the in the public school system, and we had a number of debates with him. But on this occasion, he had just had a debate with uh, with one of uh, members of the of the Lord's Church, and he actually said that he would pay to debate again. Now here's an atheist that's actually saying I would pay to debate. Now why is it why is it that denominations denominational preachers bishops, rabbis, uh, presbyters, or whatever you want to call them, why won't they make the offer? You know, I've said before, Larry Serber, as an atheist, had more faith than these, than these denominational preachers because at least he was willing to say, hey, record me, uh, examine what I'm saying, don't misquote me, you know, record what I'm saying so that you can get it right, and let's, let's debate, uh, let's find, come, to a, come to an understanding of trying to find the truth. Now, uh, Larry Serber, he never found the truth. I, th I think he saw the truth very clearly, uh, but he was out jogging a couple years ago and had a heart attack and died, so he's no longer with us in this life, but he certainly is, uh, I guarantee you, he's still a, a, a great advocate of debate, and he wishes that he'd probably listen to more debates. But nonetheless, there's, there's three, three folks from different facets, if you will, uh, one was a preacher, one was somebody in the community, and here's one that was an atheist. And they're saying, hey, let's debate. Let's debate. You know, let's have, have some debate. Debate's good. But yet when you talk to individuals who are uh, preachers, and I don't know what they have to lose, but listen to what they will say when you ask them about debating and, you know, having letting someone examine what they believe and what they, what they teach. Now listen to what I they say. I to understand another thing. This is not going to be a debate. Uh, I, I made it plain the other day when I was a guest of Charles on the buzz Wednesday afternoon, I believe it was, if I remember correctly. Uh, someone called in wanting to know if I was going to debate a certain individual. Now, I don't believe God called me to debate. I believe God called me uh, to preach the Word of God. And I want you to understand, first of all, what the Bible says about the word debate. Now, the Bible is plain, and it says things that a lot of people uh, seem to miss or just ignore. First of all, let me point out that the word debate, and I mean the English word debate, is in the Word of God twice. One time in Romans 1.29, the word debate. The second time in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 20 and is translated debates. But the word in the original Greek is in the original Greek nine times. If you want to look it up, it's the word E-R-I-S. And it's in the word of God nine times. Now a lot of people can't understand by the same word in the original Greek is translated into different words in the English language. Now, first of all, this word that's translated debates in Romans chapter 1 and verse 29, the plain of sense being filled with all unrighteousness and fornication and wickedness, curseness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, and debate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we see here where that word debate uh, it just uh, uh, isn't too good. All right, that was Mr. Ralph Laws, and uh, he was he had a program on uh, the TV station in Martinsville for a short period of time. Uh, I think it took a little doing to finally get him to pay his bill, uh, but nonetheless, he had a TV program on, and he said that he was going to allow, you know, some back and forth and let uh, us 
examined what he taught. He was all open for debate, and then he said he's not going to have debate. And he says, Romans 129, the Bible condemns debate. But friends, what the Bible is condemning in Romans 129, he's right about the Greek word there. It's, it's eris. Uh, it means to quarrel. All right? It's, it's strife, variance, things like that. But the Bible condones. Now listen, the Bible actually supports the right kind of debate. Now listen to in Acts 17. In Acts 17, verse 2, the Bible says, And Paul, as his manner was, went into them, and three Sabbaths they reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So what Paul was doing, he was reasoning with them. That, that word actually means to uh, mingle thought with thought, all right, to have a, to, to dispute or to preach or to reason with, to, uh, it's a, it's a argument or exhortation. See, so, so making an argument is not wrong. Now, if it turns into fisticuffs, yeah, that, that would be wrong, but just simply going in and reasoning is not, is not wrong. And then the Bible says he opened and alleged, opening and alleging. To open means to open up thoroughly, just like you would say, you know, let's, Let's just spread it out. Um, let's get the issue out of hand. Let's spread everything out and let's see what, what we need. It's sort of like if you're working a, a, a jigsaw puzzle, you'd want to get all the pieces lined out so you know what you're working with. Okay, well, that's what we're dealing with. We're get, let's get all the scriptures on a particular issue and let's lay them out. Let's see what we have. And then the Bible says that Paul was opening and alleging. And alleging means to place alongside, to make a deposit, if you will. Uh, so let's 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 set it forth. Let's uh, let's spread it out, and let's set forth what needs to be said, what needs to be known. And so that's what we're talking about. When we're we're talking about having a debate. If you want another verse on that, if you still if you just stay in Acts seventeen, Acts seventeen, the Bible says, verse sixteen, Acts seventeen sixteen. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews uh, and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Now here's the word disputed and it is, uh, again, it's to have an argument or exhortation to discuss, same word, disputed with them. So, friends, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with having a, an argument, have, having a debate, okay? We've got a, we've got a phone call. Uh, producers in there waving frantically, and I wasn't. I was just in my own little world. All right, here we go. You're on the air. Hello, Jane. How you doing? Hey, doing fine. Is it Jimmy? I'm doing so good. Good. I'm glad you saw something. All right. Uh, you where you putting up a quick one, too? Well, now, does this have? Let's let's stay on the topic. I'll answer that, but let's let's let our questions stay on topic, okay? I don't. I don't have a problem putting up a Christmas tree. I don't celebrate Christmas, Christ's birthday. Christ wasn't born on December twenty fifth. Uh, but putting up a Christmas tree is no different than putting up any other kind of decorations for a season. Like some people put out pumpkins around their porch, or they may put up uh, uh, I don't know something for spring. You know, so yeah. nothing. Nothing wrong with a, a particular type of decoration. I don't celebrate Christmas like the world does, in the sense of it's Christ's birthday. But um, putting up a Christmas tree in of itself, no, I don't. There's nothing can, wrong with that in the Bible. Uh, All right, Mr. Dillon. All right. Sing a Christmas song in the church? No. You don't sing Christmas songs? No. Well, if I don't celebrate Christ's birthday, why would I sing Christmas songs? You don't do that. You don't. You don't trust the Lord then. I don't, don't make Christmas tree. Don't make Christmas song. I, I don't. I don't celebrate Christmas as Christ's birthday. It's not in the Bible, and so when we when we come together to worship God, then we sing praises to God. Now, do I sing songs like Joy to the World? I do, but not. I don't sing them at Christmas time when everybody else is celebrating that time of year as Christ's birthday. I don't sing Joy to the World in December. But now, uh, I think we sang it just the other day in our worship. You know, so here we were. It's probably back in, in the summer we sang it. Why? Because it's a good song. 
you know, there is joy to the world that the Lord's come, but it's not not on December 25th. Well, I was cooking music. I was going. Well, God, he, he take care of well, me. Well, I do too. I, I, love, I love God too, but that, I'm not going to worship him in a way that the Bible doesn't uh, approve of. I'm not going to say it's Jesus' birth. Do you believe it's? Do you believe December twenty fifth is Jesus' birthday? Uh huh. Can, can you show me that in the scripture? Oh yeah, I know. He, I know when he was born. Yeah. When was he born? He was born on Christmas Day. How do you know that? God, God says so. Where? In the Bible. Where? You look it up. No, you look it up. You're saying it's in there. Give me the verse, Jimmy. I ain't got no him. All right. Well, well, find the find the verse for me, cause I I can show through scriptures, and and I may do that later on when we get a little closer to Christmas time. I can show you, give you verses to where Jesus was not born in December, not even remotely close. So, uh, but if you find that verse, if you find where Jesus was born on December twenty fifth, I sure would like to see it. Well, it's in there. Well, if it's in there, I'd like to. If if it's in there, I tell you what. If you can show me Jesus born on December twenty fifth, that thousand dollars goes to you. Uh, you got a thousand dollars. Well, you don't help the poor people, and ain't got no. How do you know I'm not helping the poor people? You don't bring help the poor people. I said, how do you know I'm not? Oh man. I said, how do you know that I'm not? Well, just, just because I said I'll give you a thousand dollars doesn't mean I don't help poor people. You give me a thousand dollars, one you can't get some. If you show me, if you show, if you show me December twenty fifth in the in uh, in the Bible where Jesus was born on December twenty fifth, I'll give you a thousand dollars. Well, I made it to you. Oh, okay. Three hundred and four people. I'm sorry. Because they ain't got no money, ain't got no job. What What does that have to do with with anything? I'm, I'm well, saying. God, God said, hey, "You are your neighbor." You folk and you know what Jesus also, do we know what Paul also said? He said, if a man doesn't work, he neither should he eat. Well, he can't find no joy. Well, well, he got to eat. Well, you got to pay your bills. Well, does, that, does, that mean, does that mean that we're obligated to help everybody comes along and says, give me money? Well, I'm, I'm going to send them to your house then. Well, I'll tell you, I'll pray for them another night. Oh, well, now praying for them is a whole lot different than giving them money. Well, we'll get we'll the poor people turn, down at you. All right, well, Jimmy, I'm gonna let you go because we're you, all right. Thanks for listening. All right, all right. Uh, that's not right. Let's see here. Here we go. All right, got a little off topic there, but uh, we'll get on. We'll get on Christmas later on. So here we are, back on, back on track. We chased a little, had a little excursion there. We're back on track. If you want to call in, uh, let me go and get these numbers. Well, we just had a phone call. If you want to call in, our phone number is a three three six. Is the area code four two seven. 9696, that's WMYN, 427 9696, or, or 627 9563, that's 627 WLOE is the, the live call in line. You can call in, that's a question, uh, like my friend Jimmy did there. And uh, we'll we'll get back on topic. Let's try to keep it on, on uh, the discussion at hand. I don't mind uh, taking a little excursion and chasing a rabbit every now and then, but. Uh, uh, we've got just a certain amount of time, so we want to try to stay on subject somewhat. But we're talking about having debate and inviting all the preachers. And so I'm showing you that Paul did this. And so we had a number of preachers. We, we listened to a number of individuals say debate's good. And we heard uh, one man say, no, debate's not good, not going to do it. And I could play you probably more people that would say it's wrong. You know, uh, Mr. Uh, Calvin Adams from the Grace Baptist Church in and Eden said the same thing, that I couldn't come in and ask a question of his evangelist uh, because they were going to have a debate. Well, it wasn't. It didn't turn into a debate until he couldn't answer a question. And so this is what we're talking about. But Paul disputed daily in the synagogue. He disputed daily in the synagogue, and that was not a, that was not a, a debate like the Bible is condemning. Let me give you one more. In Acts chapter 18... In Acts chapter 18, we're going to meet a man named Apollos. Now, Apollos had some problems that he had to be straightened out on. Uh, he was teaching the wrong wrong thing about salvation, is what the Bible says. But if you notice in Acts chapter 18, and the last 
few verses here. Let's just go to Acts chapter 18 and let's start in verse about 26 here. Um, Apollos was a man that was a fervent in the spirit, spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him, they took him unto them and expounded to him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily, now watch this, he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So here he was, mightily convincing. And that word convince means to prove downright, all right? To confute or to convince. So he was mightily convincing the Jews and that publicly, now notice publicly, a public a public debate, uh, showing from the scriptures. What was he doing? He was exhibiting it. And that's what I was, you know, that's what we're saying. Like like uh, when the caller called in and said December 25th in the Bible, I'm saying show it. Look, prove from the scripture, show from the scripture that what you're saying is true. That's all I'm asking. You know, that's all we're ever asking is just show it in the Bible. Show it from the scriptures. Now, and so debate is good. Debate is, debate is necessary. Now, the invitation for these preachers to come is, is really a, a, good, a good picture of it. It's found in Acts chapter 15. Now, folks, listen. Acts chapter 15 is a, a good example of this because the Bible says that there was a certain reason why they came together. Let's just look together. Acts 15 Verses 1, beginning in verse 1, <clears throat> we're going to look at this, this uh, uh, occasion where all these preachers came together to have a, a Bible discussion. Before I read that, I'm going to give the phone numbers out one more time. That's area code 336, and the number is 427-9696-627-9563. All right, so Acts 15. Acts 15, the Bible says, And certain men which came down from Judea, taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now, now let's look at these words here. There was no small dissension. Now what that means is, that's a controversy. That's a popular uprising or, or a particular position, all right? So they had a, had a dissension and a disputation, and that word is a mutual questioning. Now, friends, this is all we're saying. If there is something that's being taught in the Bible, there's nothing wrong with having dissension and disputation. There, there's nothing wrong with that. All right, now let's read on in the text. And, verse 3, is Acts 15, 3, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the convert, conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they come to Jerusalem, they received, uh, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Uh, but there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying it was needful to circumcise them, and to command them to keep the law. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. Now, let's listen. Is it wrong to have a Bible discussion? Is it, can we have a Bible discussion about salvation? Now, this is what we're talking about. This is why we're saying discuss about salvation. Remember back in verse 1? They said, there were some people that were saying, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So this is a matter of salvation. Why can't we have a discussion on matters of salvation? Why can't we have a discussion about what is necessary to be saved? Who, who would come to that? Who would come to a discussion about what the Bible teaches you must do or you need to do to be saved? Who's going to come? Is your, is your, would your preacher come? Would your, would your pastor come? 
with your bishop, rabbi, whoever it is that you're your elder that that you look up to and that you listen to every Sunday, would he come? I, I know there's a lot of preachers that won't come. They just would not come. They would flat out tell you that we're not going to discuss it. Now I wonder why. Because you have a, in Acts 15 you have Paul and Barnabas and all these elders and other uh, devout Christians coming together and they're they're having a discussion on on uh, uh, matters of salvation. So why wouldn't your preacher come? Would he come? And if he if he wouldn't, w would you ask him why, or would you? Think it's kind of curious that he wouldn't come? I would. I would. But I think we can have a discussion on salvation, and it's one that we need to. But if your preacher won't come, I, friends, I'm going to say you should ask why. Now listen, they came to discuss matters of salvation. And if you'll notice, verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, they said, except they be circumcised, they cannot be saved. And again in verse 5, they said, It was needful to be circumcised and command them to keep the law of Moses. So we're talking about two things that were being discussed that one group of people were saying was needful, it was, it was uh, essential, it was necessary, and except you do these things, you cannot be saved. Now friends, there's a lot of things that the Bible says is necessary for our salvation that we would agree on. But there's some things that we're not going to agree on. Some people are going to say some things are necessary and some people are going to say they're not. Like for example, some people might say, well, you have to have the Holy Spirit to be saved. Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I would disagree with that. Why don't we have a discussion on that? Why don't we, why don't we have a, a discussion on that? Is it necessary for someone to receive the Holy Spirit in order to be saved? If so, let, let's have a discussion on it. That would be like the, the Pharisees saying, well, except you be circumcised. Well, you have a group over here saying, except you receive the Holy Spirit, you can't be saved. Oh, well, let's have a discussion on it. Let's have a debate on it. Now, I'll put myself in that mix. I'm going to say, because the Bible says this, and I can show this, but the Bible says, except you be baptized. For the remission of sins, you cannot be saved. Now, somebody's going to take issue with that. Fine. That's great. You know what? That's the very thing, that's the very reason why they came together in Acts 15. They came together to discuss the things that were necessary for our salvation. All right? So, so why can't we do that? Why can't we have that discussion? Who would come? Is, is your preacher or are you so unconcerned about what the Bible says that is necessary for salvation that you wouldn't have a discussion with somebody on it? That you wouldn't even listen to a, an opposing view? That you wouldn't want to have anybody to uh, tell you something different or contrary to what you ought to believe? Why would you, have, why would you be worried about that? In Acts 15, they did not worry about that at all. They, did not, they were not troubled by it in the least. Now, listen. Here is how they determined what was necessary. Now, friends, this is so important. The way you determine what's necessary, well, let's just listen to what they say. Let's come down to verse 15. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope that you do, I hope you're, if you're sitting there listening to the radio or uh, uh, in, at a table or on the couch or in your easy chair or whatever, I hope you have a Bible in your lap and you're, you're opening the Bible to Acts 15, verse 15. And listen to what the Bible says. And to this agreed the words of the prophets. Now this is the same context of this big discussion that they're having about Gentiles and what Gentiles need to do to be saved and so forth. And to this agreed the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will, set, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth who doeth all these things known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Now, you say, well, James, that doesn't sound like about circumcision. That doesn't sound like salvation. Well, it does. Here's why. It has to do with the Gentiles. See, the question that one of the questions they were having is, should Gentiles even be received the gospel? Now, that was a big 
that was a big uh, debate, big discussion that was had way back in chapter 10. Should Gentiles receive the gospel? Should, should we go and talk to the Gentiles? Now, listen, this is why it's important. If you recall in Acts 15 and verse 7, listen to what Peter says. Peter said, he rose up, there had been much disputing, Acts 15 and verse 7, much disputing, and that, that word is a word we've already looked at, mutual questioning, discussion, reasoning. After there had been much discussion, much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So here's Peter's argument. He says, look, number one, we know the Gentiles are supposed to receive the gospel because God made choice. Uh, God made choice a, a, a good while ago, or a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel by Peter's mouth. And that, of course, is, is a reference to what happened in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. Now, friends, let's stop here. Can we have a discussion on Jews and Gentiles and what they must do to be saved? Well, we need to have that. I mean, I think that is, a, is something that's necessary for salvation. That's a, it's a subject that's necessary to be had. And here's why I say that. Because there's a lot of individuals that would say, <clears throat> you know what, there's two different Gospels. There's some people that say, well, Gentiles have one Gospel and Jews have another Gospel. And I would say, if you ask your preacher, he's probably going to tell you that. If you ask your preacher, why, why do we not baptize for the remission of sins? You know what he's going to say? That's for Jews. And he's going to say, we're Gentiles. Gentiles have another Gospel. We have the Gospel of faith. But friends, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, in Acts 15, 7, Peter said that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, we need to have this discussion. See, because necessary things, necessary things agree with what God has already said in another place. And the Gentiles were going to hear the gospel in order to be saved. Now, stay with me here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8. All right? The Bible says, The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. Now, that word heathen is the same word translated Gentiles in other places. Same word. So let's just go ahead and say Gentiles. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, when God said to Abraham, In thee shall all nations be blessed, he was talking about in Christ. How do I know that? How do I know that? Because look what Paul says, just come on down in Galatians 3. Come on down to Galatians 3, verse 16. To Abraham and his seeds were the promises made. And his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So, when he said, in, th in uh, thee shall all nations be blessed, he's talking about in Christ. In Abraham's seed, all nations are going to be blessed. And Gentiles heard the same gospel, or they were going to hear the same gospel that the Jews heard. Now, we need to have this discussion about, are there two different gospels? Friends, if there's two different gospels, then you've got Peter and Paul at odds with each other. Now, some people say that. Some say, well, I followed Paul, and the Jews followed Peter. Well, if the Jews followed Peter, why did Peter go to the Gentiles? See how it is? Peter was the first one to go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel to them. And Paul comes along in Galatians chapter 1, and look what he says. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, or excuse me, verse 7. He said, if someone comes and brings another gospel, 
All right. I'm actually, well, let's go ahead and, yeah, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, if Peter was preaching another gospel, Paul's cursing him. Because Paul is writing to the Galatians. Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia. Galatians 1, verse 1. All right? Or verse 2. The churches of Galatia. And Peter, Peter wrote to the same, the same people. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The strangers, those are Gentiles. Now, if Peter is speaking, is preaching a different gospel than Paul did, Paul just cursed him. See what we're talking about, friends? We need to have this discussion. Because understanding who is going to be saved by the gospel, it's, I would say, it's pretty important when you. I mean, if you said, well, what are some important things that you need to know about the gospel? Well, one's going to be, who's going to be saved by it? Would be a good question. So let's see, are the Jews going to be saved by one gospel and the Gentiles saved by another gospel? That's not what, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, the gospel. Romans 1 and verse 16. Uh, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation, unto, to, the Jew, uh, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power to save, to Jew and Gentile. Now, friends, don't we need to have that discussion? See, there's not, there's not another gospel. There's not a different gospel. So will your preacher have that discussion? Now, the reason why I'm saying it's, a, it's an invitation is because there's another microphone sitting right here across from me. There's another chair. There's an empty chair. As a matter of fact, there's five empty chairs in this room. And now I don't know if they've got five microphones, but I can assure you that we can accommodate if someone wants to have this discussion about what is necessary to salvation and who who does it apply to, we, we'll accommodate it. I, I, I'll buy the airtime. I will have a discussion. Come right on up here to, I don't know what this hill's called, but uh, I'm going to find out. Uh, I'm going to find out what this hill's called. And, and you know, We'll come up here to Rockingham County Hill. Right. Mayadan Mountain. All right. High top Mayadan Mountain. Now, if you want to have that discussion, come on. We'll come up here to Mayadan Mountain. You know, uh, they took Paul up to the Areopagus. That was a that was a hill. We'll take you to the mountain. All right. And let's have this discussion. Shouldn't we have that? In Acts 15, they did. They discussed matters of salvation. And so that's what we're saying. Things that, that God's already talked about and he agreed with. That's what we'll be doing, friends. We'll be saying, all right, let's, let's find out what God said about this matter. Everything that God said about salvation, who can be saved, what's necessary for salvation, let's put it all out on the table, let's spread it all out. If you've got a verse, that's one piece, we'll put, we'll put into the puzzle. If you've got another verse, this is what's needed, all right, let's put it in the puzzle. And let's see if we can't put this big puzzle together about things about salvation, necessary for salvation. Now, that's what they did. Now, let me, let me say this. Now, when they came together, they discussed things about importance. Let me show you how the Bible clearly shows that Gentiles were supposed to have this gospel, receive this gospel. If you back up to Acts chapter uh, 11, Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. You know, you may remember this verse. You may know this verse. Acts eleven twenty-six. 26. Did I say it right? Acts eleven twenty-six. And when he had found him, and I'm talking about Barnabas, went to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, why is that verse significant? Well, here's why. Back up a few verses. Back up a few verses. 
and listen to what the Bible says. Back up to verse 17. Peter is giving an, a defense about what he's done. He's gone to Cornelius' house and he's been called on the carpet for it. And he's giving an explanation about why he did this. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he said, he shows that God has received the Gentiles just like he did the Jews. Now look at verse 18. And when they heard these things, that's the Jews, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now what makes this so significant is, it's not until the Gentiles, it's not until the Gentiles come into, uh, into the fold, until they hear the gospel, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, Christians are given a new name. Now, what do you mean by that, James? What do you mean by given, given a new name? Well, let's just look. In Isaiah, and I'm, I'm believing here, so I believe it's uh, Isaiah 62, which is where I'm going to just start there. Uh, Isaiah 62 and verse 2. Isaiah said, The Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now friends, the new name, a name that had never been given to God's people, was given to God's people after the Gentiles saw the righteousness of God, after they had, had obeyed the gospel. That new name was Christian. See? And so that's why I'm saying Jews and Gentiles received the same gospel because it wasn't until the Gentiles came in that they actually got a new name. All the Christians were called, all the uh, disciples were called Christians first at Antioch after the Gentiles had been brought into the, God, in, into the kingdom. See how simple that is? Now, the, the point we're making is these are matters of, of, of faith. These are matters of, of faith that have to do with Salvation. What is necessary for salvation? Now, maybe you have some. Maybe you have a piece of the puzzle that you want to bring in. Maybe you want to have a have a, have a piece that you want to put on the table for discussion about what's necessary for salvation. That's fine. Uh, you can call in and give it to me. Phone number area code three three six. The phone number is four two seven nine six nine six. That's four two seven W M Y N R six two seven nine five six three. 627-W-L-O-E. Now, let's, let's continue on with this. So, whatever God said had to agree with what he says in another place. Now, friends, let's have this discussion. What is necessary for salvation? Whatever they, de they concluded, I want you to notice in verse 19, Acts 15, Acts 15 and verse 19. Um, listen to what I believe this is uh, uh, James that's doing the talking he stands up says men and brethren hearken unto me verse 13 <clears throat> but look what he says verse, verse 19 he says wherefore my sentence is that we trouble them not which from among the Gentiles are turned to God don't put the Old Testament on the Gentiles. They do not need to be circumcised. Now, here's my point, friends. If you think that I'm teaching something that is unnecessary for salvation, and I know some of you, I know many of you will believe that what I teach, what the Bible teaches about baptism being for the Mr. Sins, you think that's unnecessary. Uh, I know there's members of the community we're out knocking doors and talk to them about uh, salvation and baptism so as well that's not essential that's not essential well if it's not essential let's 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 demonstrate it if you can give me the verse that shows that it's not essential that's that's fine i'll i will concede that i'm wrong and i'll start preaching baptism is not essential but until you show it to me i'm going to keep preaching it because i can show you verses where the bible says it is essential now the the Baptist creed books and the, and the uh, denominational catechisms and creed books and bylaws, they're going to tell you it's not important. But the Bible certainly says it is. But the whole point of coming together in Acts 15 was to find out what is necessary for salvation. Now, 
they said, there were some people that were saying, except ye be circumcised. Well, what if I said, except ye be baptized? You cannot be saved. Now, somebody's, somebody's shaking their head now. They're going, oh, no, James, you're wrong about that. Well, let's just see what the Bible says. Let's just see what the Bible says. In Mark 16, verse 16, let's look again. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is that essential? Is that essential to salvation? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I know that you've heard, and you've heard us, uh, heard me play some of these uh, sound bites uh, before of individuals that are saying that it's not essential to, uh, uh, to be saved. But they'll tell you all kinds of things that are essential to be saved. I have, a, I have in my possession, and actually it's still out in the car, I believe. Let me see here. Uh, I have a little track here. I have a track from that was given me, and I don't know what Baptist church it was from necessarily, but it was one in, in Eden, that has a sinner's prayer in it. Now, friends, do you want to have a discussion whether the sinner's prayer is, is essential to salvation? I, I would love to have that discussion. As a matter of fact, that's one of those $1,000 questions. You know, $1,000 to find the sinner's prayer, alien sinner, someone outside of a relationship with God, says a prayer, and is saved. Now, let's have that discussion, because if it, if you say that you can be saved doing a certain thing, then to me, that's essential to salvation. That thing is essential to salvation. So, show me the verse. See how, see how easy it is? But what they did in Acts 15, they came together and they determined what God had already said. And that's the point I want, I want to drive home uh, before we end this lesson, friends. They were not determining of their own accord, their own uh, interpretation, or their own plans what was needed to, be, needed to be done. They were looking at what God had already said in order to determine if something was essential or not. And that's what I'm trying to get you to see. Your pastor, bishop, rabbi, or whoever it may be, he's not giving you the whole counsel of God. He's not giving you everything on the Bible concerning your salvation. And I would, if I were you, I'd question why not. Why do we not do something that the Bible clearly says should be done? In Acts 2 and verse 38, Acts 2 and verse 38, listen to what uh, Peter says to these men, folks on the day of Pentecost. He, they've already preached, convicted them of, of killing the Christ, convinced them that they killed the Christ. When they heard this, they were preaching their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's, let's have this discussion. Is baptism for remission of sins? Is repentance connected to baptism? Acts 2.38 says it is. Now, somebody wants to call in and says, Well, James, it says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there you go. You've got to have the Holy Ghost to be saved. Well, let's have a discussion. Because I can show you there are a number of people who had repented and believed, repeat, believed, repented, and were baptized that hadn't received the Holy Spirit. Now, were they saved? See that? Let's put all the pieces on the table. Let's, let's open it. Let's allege it. Let's lay it out here. Let's dispute it. Let's uh, discuss it. Let's have some dissension and some disputation. And let's find out what is necessary for salvation. All right? All right, friends, I'm going to give you the phone numbers one more time. We don't have much time. We're running, we've got just a few minutes left. 336 is the area code. 336, 427-9696, 427-9696, 627-9563, 627-9563, 627-WLOE is the way to remember that. All right, so let's have this discussion. Now, uh, what did God say on the matter? Well, when James heard all the discussion, and he was part of this discussion. I mean, remember who all was there? Barnabas, Paul, Peter. Hey, if they would get involved in something like that, wouldn't you? Shouldn't you? If they would get involved in something like that, shouldn't your preacher get involved with it? Again, the invitation standing. 
uh, just give me a call and say, I want to come on, I want to come on the radio with you, James. Okay, bring, bring your preacher, you know, get your preacher up here. Let's, let's let him do it. But notice he says, my sentence. Now that's his, that's his, his conclusion. When he says, uh, in Acts 15, uh, Acts 15, when, when James says, my sentence is this, he's actually coming, uh, to a conclusion about the matter. And that is, uh, we don't bother, we don't trouble them which from the Gentiles are turned to God. So, his, his sentence, his decision, uh, by implication, his, his condemnation. So if we can come to a conclusion, guess what? We're going to condemn everything that's, everything that's, uh, that's not right. Now, friends, can't we have that same conclusion? Now, he based his conclusion upon the fact that there was nothing in God's word that commanded circumcision to be saved. Because listen to what he says. He says, For as much as we have heard that certain went out from among us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Friends, if you, if you are, if someone's telling you to do something that's not a commandment of God, it's subverting your souls, and it is troubling you, and it's not necessary for salvation. Now, if someone tells you, well, you need to say the sinner's prayer. Someone says, well, you need to hit the altar. You need to get down on the knee and pray through and get the Holy Spirit and roll around the floor. Friends, can you find that in the Scripture? If you can't find it in the Scripture, all you're doing is you're letting someone tell you something that's not essential to your salvation. Now, you see how easy that is? You see how, how clear it can be? You find out what God says. If you can't find that God's saying it, then you can say, you know what? God didn't give me a commandment like that. Tithing, that's another thing. Let's just talk about that for a minute. Tithe, there's no, there's no command in the New Testament to tithe. Find the, find the command to tithe, to give a 10%. See, they're binding something on you that you didn't. Now, the result of this all, all of this is in Acts 15 and verse 25. Acts 15 and verse 25. James says, It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord. Assembled with one accord. Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? That's unity. Unanimously. Unanimity. With one accord. They were all together. When they came down to finding, let's say, we're going to do only what God says. We're going to, we're going to do things the way God says do them. Then you're going to have unity. And friends, that's really what we're saying. If all the preachers would come together and let's just sit down and say, all right, let's... let's Hash out what the Bible says you must do to be saved. But you know what they don't want to do, friends? They won't do that. Oh, they'll come together. They'll have their unity meetings. They'll have their ministerial alliances where they don't believe, they don't agree with each other, but they'll get together, they'll buddy-buddy, hold hands, and hobnob, and do all things together except sit down and open the Bible and say, why are we different? Let's find out what the Scriptures say and be unified on that. Friends, the invitation is for all the preachers to come together. The invitation is like in Acts 15. Let's come together and end in one accord. Let's be assembled in one accord and have the, have the determination that what we're going to do is find out what God says on the matter. And if God didn't say anything on the matter, we're going to drop that. We're only going to do the things that God said do. Friends, I, I hope that you see the, the beauty in God's plan. God's plan is to do these things and um, do them in such a way that it will bring unity. But only it's only going to happen if people will come together and be determined to serve God the way he says serve them, find out what he says, do those things that are most needful and essential, and get rid of the things that are not. Now, friends, we can have unity. But it really it needs to start with the, with all the preachers. 
Tell your preacher, you know what? There's a guy on the radio. He's offering a thousand dollars if you can show him the Sinner's Prayer in the Bible. There's a there's a guy on the radio. He, he's offering a thousand dollars if you can find the, um, the the church that you're in, the Baptist Church, Methodist Church, Pentecostal Church. Find it. See how it is. Now, friends, I'm out of time, uh, so I want to give you quickly give you my contact information. Two seven six three four zero two six five three is my phone number. This is a word from the Lord, brought to you by the Church of Christ that meets at two feet of the Boulevard in Eden. Thanks for listening. Until next time, God bless. Have a good night.